Last time, we dove into the entire history of Battlefield and talked about every single game from Battlefield 1942 to Battlefield 2042. But you know what we didn't talk about? The story of Battlefield. And we aren't going to talk about it here either. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's literally the entire video. Hope you all enjoy this one just as much as the last. Like the video if you do enjoy it and subscribe because that tricks YouTube into thinking I make good content. Now, we're going to follow things chronologically this time. So that means we're starting with Battlefield 1 in the year 1915 and then segueing through... Battlefield 1, Battlefield 5, Battlefield 1942, Battlefield 1943, Battlefield Vietnam, Battlefield Bad Company Vietnam, Battlefield 2, Battlefield 2 Modern Combat, Battlefield 3, Battlefield 4, Battlefield Bad Company, Battlefield Bad Company 2, Battlefield 2042, and whoo, ending with Battlefield 2142 in the year, well, 2142. Kicking things off in 1915, we've got Battlefield 1. Battlefield 1 takes place during World War 1 and doesn't feature your standard campaign. Instead, you play across six different war stories around different people in different aspects of the Great War in great campaigns such as the Italian Alps and the Deserts of Arabia. Within each of the war stories are challenges called Codex Entries. As you complete the Codex Entries, you unlock real-world historical information related to the challenge. However, these entries don't really add anything to the story of Battlefield 1 as that really comes from the war stories themselves. I'm going to be purposefully brief here because there's a lot that goes on in these stories, and unfortunately, they don't really have implications on the Battlefield storyline as a whole. The first war story, Storm of Steel, is actually a prologue to the rest of the stories. The mission took place in 1918 on the Western Front as you made a desperate last stand against an onslaught of Imperial German Army forces. During this doomed mission, you swap from one person to the next as the prior one perishes. Yeah, it's pretty morbid. The next war story, Through Mud and Blood, you follow the story of a British tank crew recruit as you drive and constantly fix your broken Mark V land ship called the Black Bass through the German line at Cambrai with a crew that, well, they don't really trust you. The third story is Friends in High Places and it follows an American pilot posing as an officer in the Royal Flying Corps. In this mission, the pilot is tasked with flying a mixed reconnaissance and combat mission along with their gunner slash photographer. Fourth is Avanti Savoy, or however you say that, where you play as a soldier in the Royal Italian Army as you search for your twin brother while fighting to push back Austro-Hungarian forces in the Italian Alps. You end up finding him, but he doesn't look so good. The fifth story, called The Runner, follows an Australian New Zealand Army Corps message runner during the British Army's landing at Gallipoli. You end up developing a kind of fatherly relationship with an underage recruit. And no, it's not weird, but you do help him out more times than you can count, and then you get bombarded by dreadnoughts. Nothing is Written is the final war story, and you follow in the steps of a female rebel involved with the Arab revolt against the Ottoman Empire. You assist in securing weapons and supplies and end up destroying the Canavar, an Ottoman armored train. Similarly to how the campaign in Battlefield 1 was broken across several stories and collectibles, so was Battlefield 5. Battlefield 5 featured events during World War II as early as 1939 with the declaration of war being played over the radio to 1945 with the defense of the Rhine Ruhr. So, technically Battlefield 5, Battlefield 1942, and Battlefield 1943 all take place within the Second World War. I'm going to take a quick sidestep here and mention that there was a basic campaign in Battlefield 1942 based on somewhat realistically portrayed battles, whereas Battlefield 1943 was completely multiplayer only and didn't actually have any kind of story elements. Alright, back to Battlefield 5. Instead of codex entries like were found in Battlefield 1, Battlefield 5 had war story challenges and letters. These letters came with transcripts that were meant for friends, family, business, sabotage, spying, and more. There were also five war stories where all characters spoke in their native language with subtitles available. My Country Calling was the prologue to Battlefield 5 and it was basically a tutorial teaching you how to use weapons, tanks, and aircraft. Of note, you play as a German tank commander named Peter Mueller and end up playing as him once again in the final war story, The Last Tiger. Under No Flag takes place in 1942 in North Africa and you play as a British prisoner transferred to the Special Boat Service in the Navy. You put your charges of robbery, arson, assault, and criminal use of explosives to good use as you destroy several German bases and installations across North Africa. Nordlies is the third war story of Battlefield 5, set in 1943 during the German occupation of Norway. You are a young woman in the Norwegian resistance on a mission to not only save your mother, Astrid, but to also sabotage German heavy water production vital to their atomic weapons program. Tirailleur, the fourth story, follows the Senegalese units of the French colonial forces during Operation Dragoon, which were the landings made in South France in August of 1944. You attack a German headquarters, some AA guns, and capture a chateau. The point of the story is that despite all the efforts of the Tirailleur Senegalese during the war, France decided to skew their history, actually replacing them with more familiar people. 
The Last Tiger was the final war story, following the story once again of veteran German tank commander Peter Mueller as he and his crew continue battling against Allied forces. They begin questioning their orders as they seemingly are left for dead despite everything they had done to defend Germany. The story ends as Americans approach the exposed crew and Mueller surrenders his Iron Cross. The ending is unsure, as your crewmate raises his gun at you, considering you to be a deserter, there is a shot that rings out. It's unsure if the shot came from the crew member or from the Americans, and the ending is left up to your own interpretation. And with that, we wrap up the World War era of Battlefield. Well, other than World War III. Next, we have Battlefield Vietnam and the Battlefield Bad Company 2 Vietnam DLC. Unfortunately, neither of these games featured a campaign, but in the original Battlefield Vietnam, it was based on historical settings like the Ho Chi Minh Trail, Battle of Hue, Operation Flaming Dart, Battle of Khe Sanh, and the Fall of Saigon. The time period for these events spanned across the mid-1950s to the mid-1970s. Fast forward to the early 2000s, and we arrive at the events of Battlefield 2 Modern Combat. Battlefield 2 on PC didn't actually feature any kind of single-player or story elements, but Battlefield 2 Modern Combat, the console exclusive, did. The fictional conflict here was between the People's Liberation Army of China, Middle East Coalition, the MEC, and NATO. The conflict starts with China advancing into Kazakhstan, while NATO forces attempt to remove them from the area. NATO, China, and the MEC diplomats attempt peace negotiations in an abandoned school guarded by both NATO and Chinese snipers. However, the NATO diplomat is assassinated by an unmarked hind helicopter that both NATO and China believe to be the other sides, which spreads the conflict from one region to the next. What follows is a series of battles between NATO and China, as well as the use of propaganda to make the other side look more evil. It's later revealed towards the end of the campaign that Commander 31, the leader of an organization called the Burning Flag, was actually the one to instigate the war by sending the helicopter to assassinate the NATO diplomat because, you know, they're hell-bent on world domination. Commander 31 then reveals to the world his master plans to send three nuclear missiles at either the US and Europe or at China in the Middle East. Being the good guy that you are, you've personally got to put a stop to this so you parachute right on into the remote burning flag hideout, deactivate the missiles and laser target designate the control tower that Commander 31 had barricaded himself inside of during the attack. You're then hailed as a hero who made NATO or China's victory possible, depending on which side you chose to play as in the last mission. Yeah, it's a little cliche, but this is Battlefield we're talking about here. Next in chronological order was Battlefield 3 in the fictional war of 2014, covering events that occurred over the span of nine months, mostly in the Iran-Iraq region. Some of the other locations include the Iranian border, Paris, and New York City. Across these different locations, you play as a variety of characters, the big bad guy being Solomon, an overseas asset for the CIA. You start off as Sergeant Henry Blackburn, a member of the U.S. Marine Corps 1st Recon Battalion with a mission to locate a U.S. squad investigating an IED in Iraq. You first get ambushed by a paramilitary insurgent group, and then while trying to extract your buddy, a massive earthquake hits the city. You wake up after being left unconscious from the earthquake and then fight your way out of the ruins of the city. Then we jump over to another story that happened on the same day, but in Iran instead of Iraq. The U.S. invades with 50,000 Marines, and you take part in an air raid against enemy fighters over the Marabad Airport region of Tehran. In the meantime, the Marines that were on the ground over in Iraq are sent to Tehran to perform a battle damage assessment of the airstrikes and apprehend the leader of the insurgency, al-Bashir. You don't find the leader, but you do learn that they have acquired portable Russian nuclear devices and that two of these three devices are missing! You start getting overrun and an M1 Abrams tank column responds to your calls for backup, but they end up getting captured and executed on film by Solomon and al-Bashir. Managing to escape death once again, you continue your search for al-Bashir and eventually find him trying to flee a firefight in an SUV. The SUV of course crashes and you capture al-Bashir, who in his critically wounded I'm about to die state, realizes that Solomon betrayed him and in turn reveals his plot to detonate the nukes in Paris and New York City like any good villain would. You get some leads, fight some Russians, and then those Russians actually find an arms dealer called Kafarov, of which the Marines find very soon after. One of the Russian dudes, Dima, learned Solomon's plans from Kafarov and explains those to Blackburn. Blackburn's dickhead commanding officer Cole arrives and Blackburn shoots him before Cole could kill Dima. Because of this, Blackburn is brought back to New York City and interrogated by the CIA on what happened and why he killed his commanding officer. The CIA explains that Solomon is a CIA informant and because there is no concrete proof that Solomon has been involved in any terrorist attacks, they believe that Blackburn was apparently tricked by the Russians. In the meantime, Dima goes to Paris to stop Solomon's attack. His team accidentally chases after what ends up being a nuclear decoy, and then a nuke goes off in the distance, leaving Dima and his team to suffer the effects of good old radiation poisoning. Back in New York City, Blackburn and his buddy Montez break out, find Solomon and chase him through the sewers on foot, and then it turns into a vehicle chase ending in a car crash. Montez gets shot and killed by Solomon, which pisses off Blackburn, who then grabs a brick and beats Solomon to death with it. 
He recovers the nuke and woohoo, New York is saved. Six years later, we find ourselves in Battlefield 4 with the War of 2020. Tensions are now at an all-time high between the United States and Russia, and in China, there's an admiral looking to overthrow the Chinese government by blaming the United States for the assassination of China's future leader and voice of peace. You play as Daniel Recker, a member of the United States Special Ops Squad, call signed Tombstone. Your squad mates include several soldiers, a CIA operative, and a Chinese Secret Service agent. Your goal is a simple one for a team of six, and that's to stop World War III from happening. Your team gets tasked with retrieving vital information in Baku, Azerbaijan. This intel suggests that Chinese Admiral Chang is planning a military coup de trois in China, which would allow him to gain full Russian support if successful. Russian special forces catch on, engaging with you in numerous firefights as you fight to the extraction point on top of a skyscraper under construction. Unfortunately, Levolution takes hold, and the skyscraper collapses due to the amount of damage it takes from the Russians. So, you commandeer a vehicle and accidentally plunge into the sea, drowning your buddy Dunn in the process. You return to the USS Valkyrie quite shook up and are informed of the assassination of the Chinese presidential candidate, and learn that Admiral Cheng is going to be the bad guy this time around. You get sent on a covert mission to rescue three VIPs, and on your way back to the Valkyrie, a massive EMP goes off, frying all electronics in the area. Realizing that there are many refugees in the area, you guide them back to the Valkyrie and then set course for the USS Titan, of which will be able to house all of the refugees. You find the Titan and learn that it's been heavily damaged by Chang's Chinese military. Obvious next task is to go scour the wreckage for survivors and intel before it sinks. You find the data of what happened before the ship was attacked, but then guess what? Chang's soldiers are back. You hijack an assault boat and make your way back to the Valkyrie, only to find it also being under siege by the Chinese forces. And in classic Battlefield fashion, you clap their cheeks and take back the bridge. You then learn that the Chinese air superiority is grounded at an airfield in Singapore due to a storm. It's a tough beach assault, but you eventually make your way to the airfield. Of course, you end up getting betrayed by the Chinese Secret Service agent, Hannah, on your team, and then are interrogated in prison by Admiral Chang. You don't say shit because you're a good guy, and you get thrown into a prison cell and awake next to a guy named Dima. He's suffering from radiation poisoning as a result of a nuclear explosion in Paris six years prior. And if you just thought, oh, Dima, that name sounds kind of familiar. Yes, this is the same Dima from the campaign in Battlefield 3. You attempt to break out Dima and the rest of your squad by causing a prison riot. You get caught at the gates by Hannah and some other soldiers. Hannah shoots the soldiers holding your squad at gunpoint, apparently trying to prove her loyalty to you after literally landing you all in prison. She explains she was tasked with protecting the assassinated presidential candidate, of which was posing as her husband. You fight your way through the Kunlun Mountains to escape and come across a tram that can take you down the mountainside. An enemy helicopter shows up and shoots down the tram, killing our old friend Dima. Forced to continue on foot for two days, you find a jeep and drive to Tashgar, finding it under siege from not only Chinese forces, but also Russian forces. You then destroy the Tashgar Dam to flood the area and destroy the Chinese Russian forces. You get picked up via C-130 using a Fulton surface-to-air recovery system and get paradropped back onto the Valkyrie, of which is under siege once again by the Chinese. Man, you just cannot catch a break from these guys, can you? You clear the deck and actually find the presidential candidate that you thought had been assassinated holed up within the ship. He comes up with a genius idea to simply show his face to the Chinese soldiers that were swarming the ship in the hopes that they'd stop fighting because the Chinese were fighting to avenge his death. In an absolute miracle, he doesn't get shot immediately, and the Chinese soldiers celebrate the news that he's still alive and thus try to call off the attack. Chang, being the power-hungry, cliche, bad guy admiral that he is, decides to bombard the Valkyrie in the hopes that he can bury the truth of the presidential candidate being alive. So you jump in a boat and rig Chang's warship to blow. Unfortunately, the remote detonation fails, requiring manual replacement of the charges. The two-timing backstabber Hannah volunteers to set a new charge, but your other squad mate Irish stops her and volunteers to do it himself. You're forced to either send Hannah to her death or Irish. There's also a third option, and that's to do nothing, which kills everyone still on the Valkyrie. I'm pretty sure everyone kills Hannah and saves their buddy Irish, but let me know down in the comments who you decided to save. As soon as the detonator goes green, you detonate the charges, Chang and his ship go bye-bye, and you fly off in your rescue helicopter. In the credits, you also hear some new dialogue between Irish and Hannah, implying that whoever you sent in to die may have actually survived somehow. Make the most of the time you got. We lose many people we love. Too many too soon. And with the conclusion of Battlefield 4 in the War of 2020, we move into the near future with the first Russian-American war with Battlefield Bad Company. Now, it's uncertain exactly how far into the future Battlefield Bad Company is, but based on the weapon and vehicle technology in the game, we're going to assume that the events of Bad Company 1 and 2 occur before the events of Battlefield 2042. The setting for Bad Company is actually in a fictional place called Serdaristan, located in Eastern Europe along the border of Russia with access to the Caspian Sea. You follow the story of Preston Barlow, a recently transferred member of the U.S. Army to the B Company of the 222nd Army Battalion, known as Bad Company, due to it being a 
and I quote, A mismatched bunch of rejects placed to serve our country as cannon fodder. I have to say, the Bad Company games have a lot more character to them than the other Battlefield games. You kick things off by getting dispatched to take out several Russian locations, including an artillery battery, anti-air emplacements, radar jammers, and a few farms. After an airstrike, you encounter the Legionnaire Mercenaries, which are a mercenary group said to be the strongest military organization in the world. Rumor says he always pays in gold bars. I'll just check uh, for a pulse in his pocket. Well, slap me hard and call me El Dorado. Okay, El Dorado, let's have a look. Whoa, whoa, finders, tokers, that's the rule. No, no. Within the suit of a dead Legionnaire mercenary, your squad mate Haggard finds a gold bar, which kicks off the squad's interest in finding more of the Legionnaire's gold. You get sent on another mission further into Russian territory and stumble across a house with the Legionnaire's insignia on a sign in front. Upon inspecting the house, you find the first full case of gold. You continue onwards, destroying fuel and missile storage facilities, anti-tank launchers, and even perform some tank escorting, and eventually get sent to check on some suspicious suspicious activity at a harbor. Turns out some trucks evacuate and a gold bar falls out. Being that your squad has gold fever by this point, you decide to follow the trucks. You find those same trucks crossing the Sardaristan border into neutral territory and Haggard, overcome with gold fever, decides to single-handedly invade a neutral country chasing after the trucks. I hate to say this, but we have to go and get him back. Do we, I mean, do we really have to go and get him back? I mean, have to? You continue onwards, destroying some radio transmission towers to cover your tracks and come across more gold in another harbor. After fighting your way through the harbor, almost entering into a Legionnaire cargo ship, you get captured by the US Army. The Army then sends you on a top secret mission to infiltrate Sardaristan and capture the president, who is believed to be selling arms to the Russians. You learn that the country is no longer neutral, however, as your helicopter gets shot down. You go destroy the bastards that shot you down and proceed to the president's personal golf course on your way to the presidential palace. You find the place absolutely infested with legionnaire mercenaries but managed to fight your way to the president. You try to get evacuated by the army, but they've ditched you at this point. The president suggests taking his personal pimped out hind helicopter. You fly that bad boy out of there and use it to destroy Sir Darristan's military infrastructure. You have to stop for fuel at some point in the Sir Darristan army attacks. You hold them off until the chopper is refueled and then you begin a flight to Russia for the president to escape into exile. On the way, the president lets you in on a little secret about where all that gold is. And then the legionnaires find you with their own pimped out chopper and shoot you down. You wake up after the crash by yourself and learn that the legionnaires capture the president. You make your way through a Russian army force and find your squad, of which apparently just escaped captivity. With your squad, you evade capture, blow up some tanks and a helicopter in classic battlefield fashion, and stumble across the president about to be executed by the Legionnaires. Can't let that happen, so you stop it and take off on a boat into the Caspian Sea. You drop the president off on a small island near Sadiz and head towards the port where the gold is on a Legionnaire tanker. You overhear that the US Army is pushing towards the port as well, so in your lust for gold, you destroy two bridges to prevent the army from getting there first. You do some battlefield stuff, find the gold in a warehouse, and then get attacked by the mercenaries. You fend them off and return to the gold, but find that the US Army has actually arrived and is packing the gold into some trucks. An army officer asks you to drive one of the trucks full of scrap metal with the convoy. You realize this might be the perfect way to get away with a truck full of gold, so that's exactly what you do. The last scene shows a legionnaire getting out of the chopper's wreckage with a real angry man face. I wondered what that's supposed to set up. I mean, like a, like a sequel or something? Battlefield Bad Company 2 occurs after the events of the first Battlefield game with the same squad, but this time in South America during the second Russian-American War. Alright, with this one we need to set the scene a little bit first by jumping back to Operation Aurora in October of 1944, when a group of US commandos infiltrated an island in the Sea of Japan to extract Japanese scientists with some important intel. The defecting scientist explains they were working on a secret weapon, codenamed the Black Weapon. They all attempt to escape the island on a stolen submarine with this intel, which they do, but then they witness the effects of the black weapon and die in the process. Nobody really knows what happened during the mission though, as it was all kept under super tight wraps. Fast forward to the present day and we find our ragtag squad in Russia attempting to secure a high value person of the US military and a device related to the black weapon. They find the device, but it turns out to be a fake. Impressed with your activities in Russia, an army general assigns you to the Special Activities Division with your first task being a delivery of information to Agent Aguirre in Bolivia, South America. You do some battlefield stuff, find the agent, and he explains that there is a satellite weapon in space. So, you move up the mountain to take over a satellite station, which you use to code the satellite to crash. You drive across the country to find the crashed satellite, fight off some Russians, and then you find that data storage unit amidst a blizzard. After being extracted, you learn from the agent that a Russian army colonel you failed to eliminate in Russia is actually the man responsible for building what resembles the black weapon. So, you learn the bad guy is named Arkady Kirilenko, and he's chilling in Chile. Next mission is to find Kirilenko with the help of the army and marines. Of course, he's a slippery snake and manages to avoid capture, but he does leave behind some 
papers in his office. Among the papers is a shipping manifest for a lost ship called the Sangre del Toro. You figure out the coordinates of the ship, do some battlefield stuff, and find some unnamed compound within the ship that you learned was essential for the black weapon in Operation Aurora. After learning this, you attempt to meet back up with Agent Aguirre in Colombia, but have to take a pit stop to do more battlefield stuff. You finish up and rendezvous with Aguirre handing over the compound. He then double crosses you as he's apparently allied with big bad boy Kirilenko. His reasoning is that he's mad at the United States for sending his commando father to his death on the original raid of Japan during Operation Aurora back in 1944. And despite the alliance he thought he had with Kirilenko, he gets betrayed and killed. Absolute shocker! Then your buddy Flynn intervenes to save the squad, but it does cost him his life. Everyone is rightfully sad over the loss of Flynn, but you've got a big bad Kirilenko out there with a super weapon, so you trudge onwards. You advance through a Venezuelan city and do some more battlefield stuff until at the climax of the fight, the black weapon detonates. This thing annihilates some US and Russian forces fighting nearby and renders all nearby tech useless. You push onwards in a hot pursuit of Kirilenko and see a plane about to take off. You all have to discard your weapons and climb aboard through the undercarriage. You make your way through the plane, taking out several guards until you reach a weapon protected by a reinforced pane of glass, of which would... Take an act of God to get through that, or a lot of C4! You continue on to the cockpit of the plane, but find it empty with Kirilenko nowhere in sight. Surprise! He was actually in the chamber with the weapon all along. You blow up a bunch of C4 to get into the chamber and destroy the weapon and proceed to bail out of the plane. As you attempt to bail out, you get tackled by Big Bad Boy himself and are forced to dive out without a parachute? Holy shit! In a scene out of a movie, you pop Kirilenko mid-free fall and get thrown a parachute to land safely alongside the rest of your squad in Texas. You start to celebrate but quickly learn that those darn Russians are invading through Alaska and into Canada, and they're quickly advancing on the US border. Battlefield Bad Company 3 confirmed? Well, at least not yet. We've got Battlefield 2042 first! During the 2030s, there were some serious climate changing events that collapsed many governments resulting in the closing of borders that resulted in over 1.2 billion people becoming displaced. There was Hurricane Zeta, the world's first Category 6 storm, a global food shortage sparking the Second Great Depression, and the European Union officially disbanding following the collapse of Germany. For mutual survival, those that were displaced band together to create their own force called the Non-Patriated or the NOPATS for short. By 2037, advances in technology allowed for humanity to begin rebuilding a global society and some remaining countries began to reopen their borders. However, the NOPATS have grown so distrustful of their former nations that they've decided to instead create their own identity, refusing to rejoin. They create task forces of military specialists to defend themselves in the event that the government powers of the world descend upon them. Three years later, in 2014, a space debris storm causes a Kessler effect to occur, causing 70% of all satellites orbiting Earth to cease functioning and crash the planet, resulting in a global blackout. Everything plunges into darkness and chaos as communication grids are destroyed and supply lines are cut off. This results in reports of hundreds of thousands of lives being lost. Of course, the US and Russia blame each other for the catastrophe, which plunges the two remaining superpowers into a proxy war to secure any remaining food and fuel supplies, hiring NOPAT task forces to do their bidding. By 2042, an all-out war is on the brink, and the NOPATs have to pick sides between the US and Russia in order to survive. There's also some funky time travel stuff going on with Battlefield 2042 Portal, so we're going to use it to time travel to the year 2106 and the start of the story for Battlefield 2142. In 2106, the world froze. After a hundred years of debate and dissension, the world's governments were forced to face the reality of climate change with the arrival of a new ice age and what would become known as the Cold War of the 22nd century. As snow and storms swept down from the north, living space and resources were swallowed by the encroaching ice and a frantic battle for survival began across the globe. Small-scale conflicts bloomed into major confrontations as desperate nations united to form two main superpowers, the European Union and the Pan-Asian Coalition. By the year 2142, and with the formation of these two superpowers came the consolidation of engineers and resources needed to develop deadly new battlefront technologies, the Titans. These vast dreadnoughts harnessed colossal destructive power with their ability to dominate the skies and lethal armored battle walkers designed to outpace and outgun infantry. Tech had advanced far enough, allowing for short duration protective shields called active defense, hovercraft tanks like the Type 32 Nekamata, personal active camouflage, deployable force shields, autonomous sentry guns, EMP and radar grenades, shock absorption boots, and even injectors that could increase a person's sprint capacity or accelerate muscle recovery. With Battlefield 2142, there wasn't actually any kind of campaign, but the world building around it was very interesting. Like my prior video, this one took a massive amount of time to create, so if you enjoyed, please hit that like button and subscribe for more content like this. I appreciate you spending some time with me today, and I hope to see you again in the next one.